I feel like this lesson's a review of, of what we've been studying on Wednesday night, uh, the past several weeks, what we've been, uh, even the men's, uh, men's day, uh, Patrick touched on a lot of the, the stories of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. And what we want to do today is just look at <clears throat> how Jesus healed during his earthly ministry and the purposes of that and what it showed about his divinity and what it showed about his power and his authority. Um, so as a, as a beginning question, uh, we know that Jesus healed during his ministry. What did that show? What did it show about Jesus? That he could heal people, uh, make the blind see, make the lame walk, raise the dead, make sick people well. Uh, what did that show about Jesus? Shows his divinity. He had a power that only God could do. Very good. Um, yeah. It showed his love. Think about, think about the story where, where Jesus was, he was actually on his way to do something else and he seen a funeral. And there was a, a widow whose son had just died. What, what did he do? He stopped what he was doing. What made him stop what he was doing and go help that lady? His compassion. So, the miracles that Jesus did, it shows his love, it shows his care, it shows his compassion, it shows his power. It show, we're going to read about uh, some of these miracles and we're going to see that it shows his authority. Not only authority to make sick people well, but to forgive sins. Because there's several of these miracles that he did <clears throat> before he ever made the lame man walk. First, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Boy, that perked some ears up, didn't it? Who's this man that can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And then we'll look at that story where Jesus says, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? We're going to look at that story real close. Yes. Uh, uh, from reading the book of Dallas earlier, he makes the point that still today, people can't change the molecular structure of water and something else. Or, you know, duplicate food. <laughs> but, you know, that was just beyond the ability of people. It, it was, it was, uh, <clears throat> a miracle is something beyond the scope of nature. Like Mike mentioned, mentioned turning water into wine uh, or multiplying five loaves and two fishes to feed thousands, 5,000 if not 10,000 of people with 12 baskets left over. Who can do that? It's, it's beyond the scope of something that man can do. It is divine. It shows his divinity. <clears throat> so we've already mentioned that it showed uh, his power and authority. It showed his compassion, uh, his desire to ease our suffering. It showed how faith is sometimes connected to healing and forgiveness. We're going to look at, at, a, at a couple of different parables. And one had to do with that person's faith that was getting healed. Another had to do with the people that brought the person to be healed. It wasn't, it was their faith that he recognized and he acted on that. So we're going to look at that. Um, here's, here's where we're going to start. Let, let's turn to the book of Luke. There's several of these in Luke. And I'll skip around a little bit between 5, 6, 7, and 8. Let's start in Luke chapter 7. And this kind of sets the stage for the purpose of miracles. Starting in, starting in verse 18. Luke 
7, 18. John's disciples told him about all of these things, calling two of them. He sent them to Jesus, sent them to the Lord and to ask, are you the one to come or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they asked just that. John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one that is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sickness, evil spirits, gave sight to many that were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those that have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Why did John's disciples go ask him this? Why did John send his disciples to ask Jesus? Are you the one? Or should we be looking for someone else? We talked about this on Wednesday night because we're studying Luke on Wednesday night. And the answer that was given, what did Jesus say to go back and tell John? What did we just read? The blinders have received their sight. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. Those that have leprosy are cleansed. The good news is being preached to the poor. Where had they heard that before? Had they heard that before? It's in Isaiah. This is... This is uh, this is a fulfillment of messianic prophecy. Jesus is telling them, I am the Messiah. You read about me in Isaiah when he said, go tell John, the blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are healed. The good news is being preached. That's a quote from Isaiah. So John's asking, are you the Messiah? Go back and tell John, yes. These things are being done. Jesus used these miracles to show his divinity. Jesus used these miracles to show that he was the Messiah. He was the son of God. He called himself the son of man. And in many of these, uh, uh, we'll, we'll read a couple more. But yes, they knew exactly when Jesus said this, it, they recalled, that's from Isaiah. And those are, those are quotes. That's Isaiah, actually, uh, verse 29, verses 18 and 19, chapter 35, 5 and 6, and chapter 61, verse 1. All, all include that about the blind receiving their sight, the lame walking, and good news being preached to the poor. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we mentioned early on that sometimes a person was healed because of their faith. Let's look at, at Luke chapter 8, verse 43 through 48. Now, here was another time <clears throat> Jesus was actually on his way to heal a sick girl, uh, Jairus' daughter. But while he was on the way, there was a crowd of people around him <clears throat> and a woman who had a, a history of, of a bleeding problem. Her faith was so strong, she thought if she could just touch him or touch the hem of his garment, that she could be healed. And that's exactly what happened. Um, Let's, let's look at, starting in verse 42, about halfway through. As Jesus was on the way, crowds were almost crushing him. A woman was there that had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. Jesus said, who touched me? 
Well, when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are all crowding around us and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out of me. Then the woman, seeing that she could no longer go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. So this is an example of someone's faith playing a big part in Jesus healing them in his earthly ministry. Now let's look, let's look back at Luke 5. Any comments before we, before we jump back and look at Luke 5? Uh, had he not pointed that out? He may have told us he that's true, too. And this is something that Patrick brought up because Patrick, uh, me, actually used that this story or this parable. The bleeding made the woman unclean. Uh, she couldn't go into the temple. Uh, she couldn't be in the, in, in the same rooms of the house as the other family. She had to be separate and apart because they would be unclean if they were around her. If Jesus had not made public the fact that she had been healed, she would have still been unclean. So not only did he heal the sickness, but he healed the problem of her being unclean. Now, she probably had to go and show herself to the elders and go through the process of no longer being unclean. But that that was a big deal about that story. Her faith had to be very strong. Yeah. It does. In, a, in another telling of this, in one of the other Gospels, it, it said the woman had spent all she had going to these doctors and no one could heal her. So she was destitute. Not only was she unclean, not only she was she an outcast, she couldn't go to the temple, she had spent all of her money. She was in dire straits. And Jesus... Uh, healed her of this and, and made her uncleanness go away. What does that tell us about his compassion and his love for her? Now we looked at how someone's faith can play a part in their healing. Let's look at how the faith of others can play a part. Look at Luke 5, 17. <clears throat> this is the story about the paralyzed man that was healed that was lowered down through the roof. Uh, I believe in Luke and Mark's account, it mentioned that they tore the roof away and he was lowered down because they couldn't get close to him. Actually, in the Matthew account, it says nothing about the roof. It could have been a different healing or it could have been the same healing that just didn't mention the fact of, of lowering through the roof. Uh, let's look at five, chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> One day when Jesus was teaching uh, and Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there, they had come to the village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could find no way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow that speaks blasphemy? Blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them and took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed, gave praise to God 
And they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This healing is not the bigger part of the story. The bigger part of this story is Jesus' authority to forgive sins. He used the healing to bring attention and contrast to, just like he said, which is easier to say, your sins be forgiven or take up your bed and walk? If, if you did say, I forgive your sins, can you see that? Can you see evidence of that necessarily? Probably not. But you see a lame man get up on his feet, take up his bed and walk away. That's in your face. That's undeniable. Which is easier to say. He can do both. And his point here, and I think the bigger point of this story, I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority to give to forgive sins on earth. So we see, we see the different ways that, that Jesus did use his miracles in his ministry to prove that he was divine, to prove, to prove that he had power that only God could give, to prove that he could forgive sins, only God can forgive sins, to prove that he had loved us, he, he had compassion for us, he wants to ease the suffering uh, that we're going through. So we see a compassionate Jesus. Uh, we see, if you remember the, I didn't, this wasn't one of the uh, scriptures that I was going to use today, but if you remember at the raising of Lazarus, Jesus wept. He was overcome with emotion because he loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha. They were very close friends. The death of a, of a close friend can be very emotional. Jesus was emotional. He was moved to tears. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, how does this apply to us today? Can Jesus heal today? He can. He does. Um, sometimes it appears it's not always immediate. Uh, we pray for healing and Sometimes it doesn't happen. But that's God's will. And sometimes it's hard for us to see the bigger picture, to see God's will and all of that, especially when we're suffering. You remember a few weeks ago, we talked about Job and his faithfulness, even though he continued to suffer. We can be faithful even though we suffer. That's what's so challenging, I think. And he got his audience before God. But when he did, he put his hand over his mouth and he said, I spoke of things that I know nothing about. You are God and I am not. And that and that's the bigger uh, story about Job, too. Jesus cares about our suffering. He cares about our health. He cares about our finances. He cares about your life. He can heal our life here. But what's more important is he can heal us spiritually and has. Ultimately, he has provided the healing for our sin problem. His death, burial, and resurrection paid the price for the sins of everyone. For you, for me, for everyone that ever has been, for everyone that ever will be. What a powerful sacrifice that happened once for all. But that is the ultimate healing that I wanted to focus on for a little bit about whether or not we suffer in this life, whether or not we're healed of our illnesses in this life, we're certainly going to be healed in the life to come. In heaven, there will be no sickness. 
There will be no sorrow. There will be no tears. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. It's, if you think about it, it, it almost amazes us. It, we can't take it all in. Um, a street of gold, whatever that looks like. Um, singing and praising God. Uh, the heavenly host, angels. Um, evil will be gone, done away with. There'll be nothing but good. He will make all things right. He will wipe away every tear. Yeah, in the absence of evil, there is no death. There is no sorrow. There is no pain. So let's think about that. I have the, for that scripture, this is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Hmm. I, had, I had forgotten what this scripture was. I'd written it down. This is talking about how we are reconciled to God. Verse, verse 21, 521 says, God had made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In a nutshell, this is our sin problem fixed. He has fixed our sin problem. We don't have to worry about not being good enough. Can you be good enough to deserve God's forgiveness? It's a gift. We can't be good enough. We, we can't do enough good things to earn our salvation. That forgiveness was paid for on the cross. And we just have to accept it. We have to believe it. We have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for our sins. On that basis, that is how our sin problem is fixed. So, even though we don't earn it, there's nothing we can do to earn it. Even though we don't deserve it, even though we can't do anything good enough to repay him, it's a gift. We are given the righteousness of God. And he took what we deserved. He took our sin and gave us his righteousness. That couldn't have happened any other way other than a gift. You know what I think about sometimes is Jesus on the cross and the blood and the drop of blood. How many sins did that forgive? The sins of man from eternity. They just... From the beginning of time till the end of time. All sin for all time. Amazing. Uh, when when, uh, when Jesus came to John the Baptist, and this is in the book of John, when, when John seen Jesus coming, he said, look, behold, the Lamb of God. What did that mean? John saw the sacrifice coming. The Lamb of God was the sacrifice that would pay for the sins of the whole world. And John knew that this was the person that he was sent to, to, to say that he's coming. John was the forerunner. He, he prepared the way for the Lord. And when he saw him coming, he recognized who he was. They were cousins, weren't they? Weren't John and Jesus cousins? Mary and uh, Elizabeth were related Sisters, sisters or cousins, they were cousins too. So make John and Jesus second cousins. Um, what happened when Elizabeth and Mary met when, when they were both pregnant with, Elizabeth was pregnant with John, Mary was pregnant with Jesus. When Mary came in, what happened? Before John the Baptist was born, he leapt in Elizabeth's womb because he knew this was the mother of Jesus. This was 
the Messiah coming into the world. He sent his disciples. Are you the one? Or should we wait for somebody else? It, it could have been John. John was in prison. John was facing certain death. Uh, it wasn't too much longer after this that John was beheaded. Um, if I was sitting in a prison cell, I'd be a little anxious about all of that. Could John have been anxious about Jesus? Maybe. But maybe it wasn't so much that as he wanted his disciples, John's disciples, to know Jesus is the one. Go and ask him and get the answer from Jesus himself. The blind are seeing, the lame are walking. These are miracles are being done. The good news is being preached to the poor. The messianic prophecies are being fulfilled. Yes, I am the one. And it's more of a confirmation uh, of that. And for John's disciples, uh, who, when John dies, who are they going to follow? Mm -hmm. They're going to look to Jesus and be his followers as well. Commentary in, uh, in Luke 7 is that John was confused because the reports he received about Jesus were unexpected and incomplete. John's doubts were natural, and Jesus didn't rebuke him for them. Instead, he responded in a way that John would understand. Jesus explained that he had accomplished what the Messiah was supposed to accomplish. God can handle our doubts and he welcomes our questions. Yeah, he didn't chastise John. <clears throat> Instead, he had compassion and he gave him the answer he was looking for. If you were in prison or in jail during this time, you didn't get fed unless somebody brought you food. If you didn't have someone to visit you, to take care of you, and to tell you information, you're in the dark. You, know, you don't know what's going on. So what little bit of news that John was getting was sketchy. He needed to know more, I think, for his peace of mind to know if these reports were true, some of them were incomplete. He, you, you don't know what he was hearing. He just was looking for reassurance that everything was going as it should. And Jesus sent back the report. Yes, it's going as it should go. We're about out of time. And I know this has kind of been a jump back and forth through a few different stories, but think about how Jesus cares about you. He cares about your life, but he cares more about your soul. He has made provision uh, for our sin problem. And as we put our faith and belief in him, uh, we can be assured that that part will be taken care of. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about God's wrath because Jesus paid that price for us on the cross. Uh, does Jesus heal today? Absolutely. Um, many times uh, we have to we have to seek medical attention. We can't just pray, God, heal me of this sickness and do nothing about it. We've got to do what we can do. God put doctors and 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 the medical uh, in place to to help take care of us to help heal our bodies. Uh, can Jesus miraculously heal today? Absolutely. He can. He does. He doesn't always, but that should not uh, break our faith. Uh, we don't see the big picture always like God does. Um, and either way, ultimately, our healing is in heaven. And that gives me great encouragement.